Welcome to another exhilarating edition of uh, Making Sense Online. We've got a delightful podcast planned today. I don't even know if this is a podcast. It's a delightful discussion with the handsome and debonair Dave Cormier. Dave, how's your week been? Uh, better than last week? Uh, it's going pretty good. We're on the second version of our faculty training course so far. That's going really well. We're getting a chance. We're getting some good feedback. And uh, this may actually be possible. You know, that's good. Yeah, well, two points for you there. How about you, George? How are you? What's going on? Very little. Um, I'm still finding the internet to be an angry place with a lot of opinionated people. And um, sure. seeing how the digital learning space is certainly impacted by, by um, just this, this enormous transition. Like, there, there's, it's hard to quantify what it is. And I know last week we spent a day talking about some of the financial aspects yep. of this. But uh, this week, I, you know, we've got a ton of that going on. But I'd like to kick off, if you're all right with this, with an interesting article that was uh, covered in, in Inside Higher Ed, but it was actually published uh, in the British Journal of the Philosophy of Science. And since neither of us are female, uh, it makes us difficult to comment uh, on this in a substantive way, but essentially what this was, <clears throat> at least from an experiential end, but it, the publisher, the editor of a journal said that she had, this was, uh, she had negligible, negligible submission from women over the last month, and she said she's never seen anything like this. And that kicked off sort of a longer conversation and sort of an analysis of the, the impact that COVID is having for people who are now sort of locked at home or quarantined at home. And it seems to be suggesting that perhaps not surprising, but the brunt of academic performance and output uh, is the impact is more significant uh, for women than it is for men. So I just wanted to flag that as a as uh, something that you don't think about necessarily, because we've talked about sort of isolated groups, who's impacted unevenly. I had a chat with a colleague last week about how the, you know, she had just recently made a big move to a new system and moved internationally. And now all of a sudden this is happening and your entire support base is gone. Like your family, your friends, your social, even just people that you might grab a coffee with is, is now done. And so there's an entire population of people who are impacted by COVID that fits a little outside of the scope of what we would view as sort of a regular impact. So I just wanted to drop that in as a starting point. Yeah, I mean, it's well, representative of our culture, right? The weight of a large number of our things actually get put onto women in our culture. Women are not treated well in higher ed as it is. You look at the roles and jobs they spend, like as, particularly as staff members, um, you end up with people who are running entire departments who are paid as admin assistants who if they were men would be project managers, right? We've, the, the universities, higher ed has been terrible to women as long as I've ever been a part of it. Um, not in all cases, in all places, obviously, but it's not, um, it's not been always a safe place. Research is the same. There are lots of women who get turned down for research based on the fact, based on their gender. Um, there's been lots, and actually they do, they get more critical responses on their student evaluations of teaching as well. Um, so, all the, and this doesn't surprise me. I mean, I hesitate to suggest why this is. I have some thoughts, uh, but certainly, as you say, outside my area of expertise, but it's not surprising. No, and, and I think, like I said, some, a part of it at least, a beginning point is acknowledging it and, and acknowledging it in very stark terms. And by that, I mean the fact that you have an editor of a journal basically saying that there is a remarkable drop off in a uh, author or submissions from from female authors that is not you know she hasn't seen before and then you know the article then goes on to discuss a little bit more about the lack of protected time the disproportionate care of children that is often assigned to uh, you know th that you know women in a household may do over you know say sort of the male in the household and the list goes on so in some ways and in, certainly in some faculties there is a a very traditionalist mindset that that exists and i think that obviously carries over into the household but for now again being fully aware that this experience is not one that i'm intimately familiar with uh just by virtue of my gender but uh, at least encourage people to have a look at it in terms of a very pronounced real articulation of what the problem is or i'd like to sorry i just like to to highlight what's being said in the chat room. 
um, I've received so many messages about being caring and reaching out to students. Women are expected to do a lot of care and emotional labor as educators as well, right? Not just in their own house. And certainly the overwhelming message that I've gotten in three weeks of interviewing people about education right now and what we need, every single one of them at some point mentions some version of pedagogies of care. Some versions of reaching out to students and seeing how they're doing, reaching out and seeing how they're feeling. And again, women often get expected to do this a lot more than men do. Um, a lot of men simply have not practiced that particular muscle, um, but they're going to need to because the teaching's not going to work otherwise. And, and in some ways, you could say certainly certain disciplines where teaching is viewed as a practice. I think that that just gap may not be as significant. And without going too much into a gendered conversation, there are spaces such as computer science and engineering where you don't necessarily have a prominent discussion of culture of care. And and you're you know you'll you'll likely see those uh, constraints be more pronounced. But as I mentioned, I I, I think it's worth drawing attention to the impact that COVID has on populations or academics or individuals who maybe aren't traditionally recognized. Like I said, somebody who's recently accepted a position to move into another part of the world. And that higher education has a lot of that transference internationally, probably more so than many other sectors. And so there are individuals there who've lost a support base. There are, you know, now, uh, academics who are at home taking care of children disproportionately that are going to have a dramatic impact on their productivity and so on. And that's those voices I haven't seen broadly enough involved in the conversation. And so at minimum, like I said, it's just saying this is something that is flying under the radar. Yeah. And there's another a couple of good articles that are being mentioned in the chat room about how, you know, Christina is saying that, she's being expected to reach out to students of other faculty, male faculty who are not doing that work. Yeah. Um, like that's, you couldn't find a more clear indication of what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Well, starting off on that chipper note, um, why don't we shift into, uh, again, the good old financial stuff, like dear Lord, this has been, the start of what's going to be, and I've used the word carnage before, and I think oddly enough, you somewhat agreed uh, with me on that instance, but I've seen now uh, that that the- Even a broken clock is right twice a day, George. I know. I like, know. In fact, depending, well, anyway, we won't go there. So, well, I mean, a mechanical clock, not a digital clock. It's broken all the time. Yeah, there we go. Um, so, economics. Huge numbers coming out yesterday. University of Michigan said that they may be facing something in the range of four hundred million to one million, billion, billion dollars in shortfall. Um, this is not business as usual. This is not a bump that we're going to ride. University of Manitoba uh, received notification from the government that they should prepare a series of scenarios: ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent cuts. Now, you and I talked about this really right at the start of this course and these particular conversations that we had. Universities don't have the latitude to cut that they did pre-2008. They're running very lean. Any cuts happening now are going to be support staff almost immediately and beyond support staff, faculty. Uh, I fully expect, as we talked earlier, faculties to shut down programs to be forced to merge. So let's look at a system. Now, I have no idea what the annual budget is for University of Michigan. If it's a typical flagship university in the US, I'm gonna guess around the 3 billion to maybe 4 billion annual uh, total would be roughly the, the envelope you know, that they're within. So that means they're looking at probably a 25 to 30% loss because they have something in the range of almost 40% of their population as international students. What are you hearing in, say, Ontario or more broadly, the Canadian context in terms of the economics emerging? Well, um, I hadn't heard the numbers from the University of Manitoba. I know that there is some talk of people trying to have a different conversation with government right now. I mean, we have a very different relationship with government in Canada than the United States does in terms of higher ed. Um, the connection I think is a little tighter. There are like whole ministries that are responsible for it in ways that um, certainly in Ontario and in BC and Canada, we have very formalized structures for that conversation. Um, in talks I had last week, 
um, with people and that's that's a whole six five six days ago and things have changed a lot in five or six days and they're moving pretty quickly um, it's all wait and see here right now everybody is like so uh, are we gonna because nobody's convinced nobody's actually sold on the fact that the universities are gonna fail yet and I don't think that the governments have quite come to terms with how insane their shortfall is going to be right now. Like, I, so the sense I'm getting is everybody's just holding their breath. So if you look at my institution mm -hmm. as an example, our courses need to be decided for the fall in the next, well, they normally would have been done already. We would have already chosen the format of teaching and formats the intro wouldn't have been interesting to talk about last year but this year it's kind of interesting so we need to decide if normally would have decided what was going to be online what not online for the fall a couple days ago um now in the next week or two that decision's going to get made i think there's going to be a real descending cascade that's going to come decision making cascade that's going to come once people start having concrete decisions about fall because that's where the real money decision is right yeah summer is variable sometimes we do good in the summer i don't mean us in my institution particularly but sometimes there's more courses sometimes there's less courses but the real meat and potatoes of the funding that we actually have control over is how many humans come to pay for five courses a term with the intention of keeping them for four or five or six years right and yeah. if we lose 20 percent of them um minimum right and then if the government looks at its own budgets and says, we're going to cut 20%, that's more than 20%. My math isn't great, but I'm pretty sure that's more because I think it's going to come from, but we, none of that stuff is happening. Not at, not at my level. I haven't, maybe the provost at this point in my institution knows or other ones, but the people I've been talking to, even in those senior positions are like, we don't know yet. So let's chase this down a little bit and say, oh, all right, so we are now expecting, not unrealistically, 20, 30% drop in revenue in most institutions. This is not something higher education has ever experienced, no. uh, or at least in recent memory has ever experienced. This is something that we had an indicator of what it looks like last year when Alaska had a massive cut to their university sector that got clawed back a little bit, but it was in these you know, 30, 40% ranges of, of tuition decrease, which resulted in catastrophic planning, right? Program mergers, faculty shutdowns, uh, you know, forced retirements or whatever else was going on. So it was a pretty significant impact. So I'm going to suggest that, cause this is something universities aren't good at. And so I'm gonna try and weave together two separate threads here right now. So one, the university, I don't think it's unrealistic for us to see almost the emergence of sort of corporate raiders that you might've found in the 1980s or people who are hired specifically to come in to clean up a university, meaning, oh, right. you know, this is going to be the Deloitte's this, we, we don't have these kinds of personalities in higher education. So, well, we do perhaps, but <laughs> That's beautiful, Dave. I feel like I'm just lovingly looking over your shoulder, just saying, Dave, I want you to be the best version of you that you can be. That's not at all weird. <laughs> so what I think is interesting there is how are they going to do that? Because we don't have a culture of cost cutting to do that. There were people that you hire in a corporate space where if you have a 30% drop in revenue, your shareholders bring in firm X to help clean stuff up and get you set for profit. Could you see something like that happening in the university sector where we, because it's easier as president to have, to hire a firm that comes in, makes recommendations. You're one stage removed from being the asshole. Particularly if the government mandates it, exactly. then you're two steps removed. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. So you well know that this happened in 2008 um, because I believe you've been in an institution where this has happened before where a Deloitte style company has come in, they've done, um, you know, lean six Sigma reviews of how your processes connect to the what's it's. And then they come out the other side and go, well, the real problem here is that it takes you too long for like, I'm speculating here, but lean six Sigma is kind of fun that way. The real problem is it takes too long to get from somebody doesn't know to somebody knows we need to do this more efficiently. 
right? But once we start having that conversation, um, yes, it's going to happen because somebody is going to look like, and contractually, they're stuck in some cases. Like uh, I remember seven or eight years ago, the University um, Acadia in, in Canada signed a contract with its faculty where they had a mandatory faculty complement as part of the contract and they couldn't actually get rid of anybody. Um, so they're, everybody's contracts have all these weirdnesses put into them. Um, and so there's going to be a riot, right, in terms of people's response to it. But yeah, they're going to have to. The question is, though, is what are they going to do? So they can fire all the support staff they want. That's not going to add up to the numbers that we're talking about here. You know, if you're not talking but about moving, if you're not removing people, you remove people at $40,000 a year, it's not the same as removing people at $200,000 a year. Um, and, yeah. And well, I've seen universities that have already started with uh, admin cuts. You know, if you yeah. have a 10 to 15 to 20 percent uh, salary reduction for uh, faculty that are earning, you know, 150 to 200 K, um, you know, that that's starting to emerge as well. I, I don't like I'm trying not to overstate this. But the I the, we're talking carnage, like we're not talking a cut or like we're talking an irrevocable alteration to the fabric of higher education. The, something that the system has never faced where you're going to bring in corporate players who their role will be cost cutting and uh, forced relevance for these universities or uh, forced market realities because the state budgets aren't even coming in yet. Right. The the uh, and, and by the way, the, the list here. So, for example, this is a while ago. You can download various apps that look at the salaries of faculty at different universities. And and I, without going on, you know, going on memory here, but at UTA, for example, we had, you know, probably a dozen people that were over the three hundred thousand uh, a yeah. year range. Business, healthcare. Uh, engineering, some of those high income faculty where, where you know, they have uh, a much better profile. Or then when you look at the provost level on up, which universities have become quite admin heavy given the broader programs that they've created, those are the 300 plus salary ranges. So yeah, a regular faculty member in Canada is going to max out probably close to 150 to 175. Uh, even it in maxes at 230 here. Okay. So, um, and I remember when I was at Athabasca, the highest paid salary was 180 K, uh, for, for faculty only, not administration. So I think, I think the key question here for me is what are the things that we can, that those people are going to be able to measure, right? Cause they're going to come in and want to measure things. They're going to ask for a KPI of some kind, and they're going to want to measure those things. They're going to put it into some kind of formula and they're going to want to impose that formula. You know what's going to happen is is market friendly positions are going to be retained ones that because they're going to in typical sense there there's been a gradual reduction of humanities voices in the leadership yeah. of university so I think it'll be is it marketable is it job ready whatever that means to you those are going to be the ones that will be favored and it in humanities departments have seen a steady decline but like I said previously I I'm not. Within university systems such as the U.S., within multi-campus environments, I, I believe you're going to, the only way you can move forward is at some level with faculty reductions. And they can do that if they declare a state of emergency. Tenure doesn't mean as much. So there is a way around tenure if, if a financial crisis is yeah. declared. But anyway, so I would suggest the most prominent trend that we should be paying attention to is what is happening in the US setting, Australia as well, because you've got systems there that are saying 600 million shortfall this semester. Um, they're growing number 21,000 jobs were forecast to be lost as we discussed previously in the higher education sector in Australia. The most important trend line to watch is the impact that the pandemic is having on state and government budgets, provincial as well, because that is going to be earliest, the most flexible thing to cut is universities. They're not going to cut healthcare in the middle of a pandemic, or at least most states won't cut it aggressively. Universities are exceptionally vulnerable. And frankly, it's easier for them to cut universities than it is for them to cut the K-12 system. Because there's only so much sympathy and support that a faculty member who is making the money that they make is going to get from the voting population. 
whereas gutting the education system is universe, the K-12 education system is almost universally derided. Exactly. And, and so what I can see happening is uh, certainly the private systems will be all right. You're, you know, yeah, they might, their endowments may drop from 39 billion to 34 billion because the stock market's going down, but they'll bounce back. They'll be all right. Don't worry too much about them, Dave. Um, but I agree with you. The university sector is much easier to cut. Like when you look at it from a government perspective, the big areas of revenue or of expenses is certainly education and healthcare. Now education, like you noted, fits into two categories. Cutting university is different than cutting K to 12, partly because the K to 12 sector, at least in a Canadian sense, has a much stronger union to respond to those kinds of, of cuts, just like healthcare does. Also, it underpins the economy anyway, because that's the daycare that allows other people to go to work. Yeah. Like there are simple reasons why it just needs to be there to cut it. Like to have fewer people in our K 12 system is just not going to work. You can make more people, put more people in the classrooms. Most of the physical structures aren't built for it. Like there are, there are ways in which cutting it just is hard. Whereas saying, oh, those faculty out there who are teaching 11 people a term, maybe, yeah. you know, maybe we don't need that anymore. I mean, I've seen over the years, I've seen classes where somebody is teaching three people a term. Yeah. Right. And they're still being paid as full professors. Yep. Well, it's and, hard and to argue. This is a study that was done a number of years ago. I think it was out of Texas A&M. So, you know, some universities periodically love to embrace corporate style metrics. And uh, I remember this happening. I think it was with A&M and they decided to do an assessment of how much our faculty worth. And they basically found like if you had a Nobel, uh, you know, like a, uh, a laureate, like a, a internationally regarded poet that's teaching 15 students a semester, you were economically worth less to the university than a mediocre level of computer science faculty member who was teaching 300 students a semester. Well, so this is the KPI stuff that I'm talking exactly. about. Exactly. And, and they're warped because the KPIs are not going to be biased toward human flourishing. They're going to be biased toward the economic reality of the job market because those are the voices that have been growing in prominence over the last several decades. So let me push you in another direction then. Are we also going to stop caring about the fact that you published in a high piece journal because that also doesn't bring any money into the institution? That's a tough one. I, I don't know. I, I think we will still care about that because, well, okay, so my view here is what is integrated into systems is harder to change. So once yes. something is systemically integrated, you have to change a sequence of factors in order to make that change. So many systems, UK and Australia being the more pronounced ones that have rankings for annual reviews that are connected to where you've published. It's not prominent in the US. It's not as prominent from a t faculty assessment perspective in Canada either. But in those regions where it is, they've tied research access dollars even to where you're publishing. Once something is part of a system rather than a standalone thing, it's harder to change. That's why I think, you know, humanities, for example, have been vulnerable for a while because they've made a long-term argument. They make a 30-year argument in, in light of decisions being made on annual budgets. A 30-year argument in a state of annual budgets doesn't win readily because you have to believe that democracy, uh, critical thought, uh, freedom of expression are core values that universities need to promote and perpetuate. Now, when your budget shortfall comes in and you've got the person standing in a corner arguing for democracy, that's a different voice than someone saying, I need 50 people to work in my factory this week, or I need these skill sets. Guess who yeah. is lobbying? You know, who has the networked infrastructure to influence that change? So I guess what I'm trying to get at with that is, if it's systemically connected, such as reviews and evaluations of publication, it'll, that trend won't break. Humanities have had an issue of becoming systemically integrated. And that's why, which is just a simple flip, because I saw a tweet on this recently. Someone had said, hey, if uh, you're thinking of going with an OPM, call us instead. What's your take? If you were a per and this is someone in sort of the digital pedagogy ed tech field. So if in your case, what would be your response? If you're your VP, Dave, you're a provost, mm -hmm. you've got to get ready for fall. Would you contact, yeah. say, a group of ed tech folks to help you move online? Or would you pick up? the phone and call an OPM? How would you respond? Well, I mean, I've been contacted by a number of them in the last couple of weeks asking me to have conversations with them. Um, I think that you're selling, I, I think it's 
it's a final closure. It's a path to final closure. If you decide that your education can be done outside of your organization, then you've started down the path of closure of your institution. That, that's my position. So I would tell, if I was a VP, the thing I would say to my president is, look, this is harder, but if we don't do this, in 10 years, we won't be here. But what if a president, though, is thinking, yes, that's harder, but guess who's also not going to be here in 10 years? Me as a president. I no need president to stays anywhere for 10 years. Yeah. I'm just Presidents saying, like, are like, uh, like, like uh, people in government, right? It's four or eight. That's it. Five yeah, or ten. So if that's the case, then what do you want to do? I would say you're going to see a lot of people buying the OPM package, which they have already, not because it's the right thing to do, but it's the expedient thing to do. And let's face it, OPMs bring it's resources to bear. The and the expedient decision. It's the expedient decision, but it's not, not the that, expedient also, experience. OPMs, the people I've talked to, the people I've talked to who are in these situations. Yeah. So I know people who are into 10 year contracts with OPM are not getting their courses taught. Well, see, it's one of the not, benefits the, that OPM service is not providing. Yeah, but another benefit OPMs have, at least argumentatively, is that they promote the they help with the recruitment and a range of other functionality. And it's and I understand not. that that's part of the sales pitch. What yeah. I'm saying is that the directors that I'm talking to who are stuck in these situations are not receiving that recruitment benefit. Oh. Absolutely. Because it's different. It was in 1990s or early 2000s, even, even 10 years ago, if you went out, like, so UTA, as an example, has the largest online nursing program, uh, you know, in the country. When you are first out of the gate with a program, you have tremendous uptake from yeah. the population that needs this, because there's a legit sure. need for people who are sort of mid-career that want to get a master in order to move forward in their position. And so to do that, master's makes a lot of sense. Just like Athabasca University at one point had probably one of the largest MBA programs in the world because they were first out of the gate. But now everybody's trying to get out of the gate. We've, yeah. we've moved from the international students as our saving grace to online learning as our saving grace, which didn't 100% work out, to now a lot of interest in corporate learning and lifelong learning. So yeah. providing academic programs to the corporate sector is the, the current area of saving grace. The international student population is not going to come back for years if ever post this event right but i don't want i don't want to drop this whole opm discussion because opm discussion to me is the same as we're getting from i put them in the same category as the proctoring people right the proctoring people have a sales pitch on the front end that say that they're going to use artificial intelligence whatever that is to check to see whether or not students are cheating and we have definite we have definitive evidence that it doesn't work and yet the decision to use the proctoring software releases the administration from the immediate problem of what to do about the fact that most of our courses are uh, rigorized by exams by invigilated exams right the practice of it is that the back end of this is going to be a total disaster once people start appealing this because it's going to be a mess the harder thing to do, which keeps your institution inside your institution, is to figure out a solution that's about having a better product inside of your education process that actually makes people want to come to your institution. Not everybody's going to make that decision, but I will make the bold claim that the people who do make that decision to decide that what they want to do is offer a good education, shocking, that that's the decision they make, are going to do better in this than the people who sign on the proctoring and then sign or sign out to an OPM because that OPM right now, first of all, have more uh, clients than they can handle. And what happens in that case? I mean, you've, you've been around the industry for long enough to know what happens whenever a software company gets popular. Suddenly that fantastic service you had at the front end evaporates because they simply don't have the talented bodies in the house to be able to do the work anymore. That's what's gonna happen with the OPMs. Maybe one company manages to do a great job but the bodies aren't out there for them to skip to, to increase their workforce right now. So the salespeople are going to sell whatever they can along the same model that they've been selling. You're going to get inside of an OPM. 
you're going to find out that the product, the quality of the product is going to suck because the people who are doing it are the people they just hired two months ago and didn't have time to train. And then you're going to be stuck. And all of the money you could have used to actually invest in your own workforce and try to actually be a university is going to be gone. Raw. <laughs> and I've said for, for years, if, if you outsource a core function of your university, dead. Well, it's how can you, you know, how can you survive long term? It's one of the arguments I made years ago that I was hoping would come out of the open online course movement is that it would give universities the opportunity to build that capacity with digital teaching, learning and online learning in general. Anyway, we're at the end of the uh, little discussion here. Any final thoughts from you, Dave? I think you're right, George. Good. On that note, I'm going to end the recording because there's no need to say anything else. Good to chat, Dave. <laughs>